met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level stand, stands stretch far away. This poem, entitled Ozymandias by Percy Shelley, is a great picture of the transient human experience, or the non-permanence of what human beings are and the stuff that we create. And this gentleman, Ozymandias, whoever he was, probably a king of some sort, had, it, had at one point uh, exerted his power over the place where his statue had stood. And he could take on all comers, and there was no one to challenge him. But perhaps war or misfortune or natural disaster or as is often the case, just time itself had worn away his empire and had left it with nothing but a broken statue. But all he really wanted probably was just to be remembered, to be known for what he had accomplished and for what he had done while he was here on earth. And that really is all that we want as human beings. We want to leave a legacy. We want to know that our lives held purpose. We want things to live on beyond us that when we get done and when we pass on in death, that at some point it be like beyond just our family or our kids. And so it leaves us with these questions sometimes because we're so striving after this legacy and after wishing to be known and to lead something that we can get really depressed and ask, what am I even here for? Because I don't even know if I'm like important, no one really knows me, I'm just working at this school or this factory or whatever it is for 50 years and then nothing. And we, we have to like build ourselves up. It's like, what is my purpose? Why do I even need to get out of bed this morning? I mean, it's, it's difficult sometimes. And just knowing what it means to be human, let alone where we're supposed to be going. And so our passage this morning will answer those questions of what does it mean to be human? Why are we here? What is our purpose? And we were going to see it from God's perspective. And we have to see it from God's perspective because we have lots of answers. There are lots of answers to why we are here and what our purpose is. And of course, the one that is extremely depressing is there really isn't a reason. We just live so many years and we die. It's over. You know, it's just here today, gone tomorrow. And then there's the people that's like, well, I'm just going to cram in everything that I can possibly do. We're going to have all the experiences. I'm going to accumulate all the toys I can. And then, you know, at some point that'll matter. And, you know, I will, when I die, I'll feel that I've accomplished something. And then there's the people that, well, toys and stuff, I probably won't be able to do all those. So we should just love. We should just, you know, make sure everything is just, going well and we can try and leave the world in a little better place than when we entered it. And some of these are okay answers, but it, it really doesn't, they aren't fulfilling, these answers. It's, we just need something just a little bit more. Just, we want just something that seems more permanent than some of these transient uh, answers. And so to answer these questions this morning, we're going to continue the series we started last week 
uh, we were talking about God last week and who he was. And this week we're going to continue in the next chapter and talk about who we are and what it means to be truly human. And as we said last week, this was written to the Israelites when they had come out of uh, slavery. They had been oppressed. They had been uh, hurt. They had cried out in pain and frustration. They had just been worked, in some cases, worked to death. Their, their lives were in somebody else's hands. And this person was the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the most powerful person at the time. And people looked to him as God. He was the only one that was uh, perfected as a human being. And everyone else was his property, and he could do pretty much what he wanted to with them. And so as they are traveling out into the desert, headed for the promised land, God has said, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And, but they had to know what that meant. Is there going to be some sort of status thing, kind of levels, or, or what? And so God tells them specifically in our verses today who they are as human beings. And there are three things that he says in these verses to them. The first is that we, as human beings, have a unique position in all of creation. We have a unique position. And then he tells them that we have a lofty purpose. And that to fulfill that purpose, we need each other. So a unique position, a lofty purpose, and that we need each other. Turn with me, if you wish to, to Genesis chapter 1 again. We will be in chapter 1, and, and then we will be in chapter 2 as well. And the first thing we see as we are looking in this, in this passage is that we as human beings have a unique position, a special place, a specific level in all of creation, a unique position. And that position is that we as human beings are the pinnacle of creation. If you remember from our reading last week, the passage kind of got into this rhythm. And it said, God said, let there be, and it was, and it was good. And God said, let it be, and it was, and it was good. God said, let it be, and it was, and it was good. And all of a sudden, there's this pause. And then God says in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. So the first thing we are in this position is, is called an image bearer, or we are in the likeness of God. We're created like him. And this is kind of a interesting concept to get our mind around. What does this mean? And what, what this was in this time period was just like Ozymandias. He had a statue and he put the statue in a faraway town and he would, well, looking at the statue, you would know who owned the land, who was the ruler. We do this today. Or if you've ever visited the federal buildings, we have a picture of the president and a picture of whatever department secretary happens to be over that particular office, but they're on the wall. That is the image bearer. And so that is what we are. We are God's representative. We are God's ambassadors, if you will, to this world. Even though he is present and he is in charge, he has allowed us to partake with him as a partner in this world. So what does that mean to us? If, if I am an image bearer and you are an image bearer and everyone here is an image bearer, then each one of you has a dignity unmatched in the creation. And this last week we've been arguing in this country over 
which race may or may not be superior. And don't get me wrong, there is none. There are no superior races because we are all image bearers. And so we cannot look down on anyone else that is also made in the image of God. We cannot hurt them. We cannot insult them. We cannot keep them from taking advantage of things that they are allowed to. But the other sad thing this week is the news out of, uh, I can't remember right now the country, but they said they had wiped out uh, Down syndrome. And what they had done was they had nearly 100% abortion. And so they had considered these people with handicaps to be not level of, not worthy enough to be a human being. And that's just sad because they, even though they may not have the faculties that some of us do, they are still made in the image of God. They are created by him and loved. And it reminds me of, of the song that was from the Civil War era. And it was about a guy who went to the recruiter and wanted to get into the war, but he had to go and, and see the doctor first. And it is somewhat of a, it, unfortunately, it's a, it's a funny song, or it's comedy, but he gets rejected for having some sort of infirmity that he cannot fight in the, the war. And so the chorus goes, I'm, now I'm with the invalids. I can't go and fight, sir. The doctor told me so, you know. I guess he must be right, sir. And we laugh at that, but if you are, but the word invalid is so close to invalid that we cannot even have, we cannot think of people that way, especially since they are an image bearer of our God. So we as humans have a unique position. But with this unique position comes an incredibly lofty purpose. And chapter 2, starting in verse 4, reads this way. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. And there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and there it was separated into four headwaters. And skipping down to verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. So our lofty position, our lofty purpose, an incredible duty, a high calling, is as image bearers, we are called to rule. We read it in the first verses. In some of your translation, it has the word dominion, but we are supposed to exercise authority over creation in God's place here on earth. And in that, we are supposed to fill the earth with ourselves and then subdue it. And a lot of people take those those verses to be having children as married couples and just making population, and it is that. That is one way. But what this is talking about, I believe, is that we need to fill the earth with image bearers, those who worship the Lord. And if we have a 
an entire world of people who worship the Lord, that would be wonderful. It's not going to happen until he comes back. But that is the goal. That is what we are headed towards, is to make the creation how God would want it. To have everyone and everything worship him and, and tell him that he is God. And it, it goes with the Lord's Prayer where it says, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the fill and subdue it. But the other thing, while we're doing that though, the other thing here in these verses is that we need to work it and take care of it. Yes, I'm sorry. Work was around before the fall. So it is not something that is a bad thing. It was what we were put on this earth to do. And what Adam was to do was to take the creation and, and take such good care of it that it would, everything would be right. These, this phrase is used other places in the, in the Bible, but it is only used of temple worship of doing sacrifices, of, of maintaining the worship of the Lord. And so what we do here on earth, any job that we have can be a worship of the Lord. One of the books I was reading this summer for my class was a book by Brother Lawrence. He was a monk in the 12, 1300s, I believe. But his idea was that he worked in the kitchen of the monastery in the day. And he is famously, he has famously said that him peeling potatoes was just as mo just as much worship of God as his prayers. But anything he was doing during the day, whether uh, peeling potatoes or washing stuff or going and getting provisions for the monastery, which was also his job, he did it to the glory of the Lord, and it was like offering a sacrifice or offering a prayer. And that this is why Paul can say later that whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of the Lord. That's what this is, is to work it and care for it. And so the implications for us today when we're talking about working on the earth, there's much debate about how much of it we can use, and can we chop down trees, and can we hunt animals, and all these kinds of things, and there's people that fall on all kinds of that, all sides of that. But what I offer this morning, I'm not gonna say that, uh, you know, how much, whatever, but what we need as human beings with this lofty purpose is a reasonable care of the earth. We shouldn't neglect it, and we shouldn't waste it. We should, as image bearers and ambassadors, we should care for the world as much as God cares for it. And he truly loves it. He crafted it all to be perfect and it was good. So we as humans have a unique position and this lofty purpose. But are you discouraged yet? That's pretty tough. I don't know about you, but when I was like, think about it, ruling the earth as God's representative. And I was like, oh man, I, I don't know. I, just, I don't think that's possible. I don't, it's not, I don't know if I can do that. And that's okay. We can't do it individually to be true image bearers and fulfill our lofty purpose. We have to do it together. We have to come together as a community using all of our gifts and work to this common purpose. And continuing in chapter two, verse 18, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs 
and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, this is a passage on marriage, but I don't want the singles in the crowd to fall asleep on me. All right? So I'm going to try and, and explain it so that it reaches a wider audience. All right? And the first thing we need to see here, though, is that this is the first time in the creation account when man was alone that it was not good. This was the first time. It had been good and very good up to this point. But now he had this person alone in the garden, and it was not good. Now, we can make all kinds of jokes about that. But in a sense, we are made for community. Without, We cannot be alone and live very long. Uh, there's a lot of people who try, but you still end up being lonely and wishing to hear somebody's voice at least. And so in this case, God says, I'm going to make a helper. And in this case, he makes woman. And I'm really glad he did. I love my wife and that he has sent her to me. Uh, she's been gone up to Nebraska this week, and I have no life without her. I have no motivation. I can't get anything done. I eat wrong. I mean, it's just horrible. And so I love having her around. And this is what this is. But... We get this helper wrong. A lot of the times we look down on, on womanhood or our wives or our sisters or whatever. We think that they are less, but they are not. The first chapter says they are image bearers. And so this word, we need to get right. And what it is, it's not like a slave or a servant. This is a armor bearer. This is the guy that would go with a warrior and hand him stuff. All right, so he's in it with the person he's following around. This is like a serious task. All right, he may not be fighting as much. He's handing stuff, and so the warrior protects him, and he hands arrows and whatever else. So this is what this is. This is the helper that God has created for us. And this is what we need to be, not only in marriage, it should be this way, a mutual a thing for a common purpose, but it is also in our churches. Paul will say that we need to keep, make every effort to keep the unity in the bond of peace. He says, Jews, Gentiles, male, female, slave, free, there is no difference. And as we talk about here, this is this uh, helper and uh, person that he try and rule to try to fill the earth with God's glory and worshipers of him. And finally, this being in community and then doing it right and with unity and with single-minded purpose leads to vulnerability without fear. I like how this ends, that they were naked and there was no shame. Right? One of the things that is the hardest uh, activity for a Christian to do is to speak of their shortcomings. Because, and I've done it, and I, I'm pretty sure you have. It's like, well, if they really knew me, if they really knew what I had done or, or who I was or or my insecurities and my fears, they wouldn't love me. And that is shame. Right? But if we're doing this right and we have the identity in, our, in place in Jesus Christ, if that goes away, I can speak of those things. And you can love me because God loves me. I love that song that we say. It's not because of who I am, it's what you have done. It's not because of what I've done, it's who you are. And it is so true. And it was so true that he loved the world and his human creation that he sent his son to be one of us, to take on humanness and 
that is what we as human beings can aspire to, to live up to. We can try in our weaknesses and our shortcomings to be Christ-like. So to fulfill our purpose, we need each other. There are many voices today that say that life is not precious. Certain people are not worthy of living or they just don't have a purpose. We're just going to shove them off in a corner or eliminate them altogether. We do that when they're very young, the infirm, and more and more I hear it from our older people that are, it's, I just don't have any purpose anymore. I don't, I don't know why I'm still here. And that's sad. I hope that you are encouraged today because God sees you different. God sees you as the pinnacle of his creation. And that is your unique position. No matter what gifts you have, no matter what talents, you can have a whole bunch or just one or seemingly none, but you are an image bearer of Christ. And I want you to hear that this morning. And we have a truly lofty purpose. There are people around us that need to hear of God and need to learn to worship Him. And in some cases, we need to learn to worship Him. But we need to spread Him and this picture of who we are as human beings to the entire world. And that is really lofty. And we can't do it alone. I've been listening to a song here recently and I thought about playing it this morning, but then I changed my mind. But it's by Hezekiah Walker. And it, the title of it is, I Need You to Survive. And it's so true. And the, the lyrics are like, I need you. You need me. We're part of God's family. So I'm not going to injure you with my mouth. I'm not trying to hurt you with my words. Because I need you to survive. And part of this song is like, pray for me. I will pray for you. Because we're part of God's family. It's, it has convicted me that I have too often walked by people and or said I could do it alone. Or just, I, and I've said it often, people are like, I don't need you. Uh, you just messed stuff up. I can, I, I'm going to do it right I'm going to do it alone. But in our passage this morning, we're going to be truly human. We are going to leave a legacy. If we are going to know truly why we're here and what we're about, we need each other. So I would say as I close tonight, I need you. And you need me. I will pray for you. Pray for me. Because I need you to survive. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we confess that we don't always believe that you truly love us. We have stuff in our lives, Lord, that is ugly, and you know it, and we know it. And we have shortcomings, and we have weaknesses, and we have illnesses, and we have injuries, and all these kinds of things. But we praise you that you love in spite of all those things. That while we were yet sinners, you came. You took on our flesh and you died in our place. And we could not praise you enough for that. And one day, one day we will see you as you are and then we will be as we should be. But we pray that you would help us come alongside us and guide us into knowing our purpose here and believing what it means to be in your image. And that we would truly come together as a people of God and as a church and as a community to reach out to our neighbors and to reach out to those around us who 
need to hear this message of love and good news and, and grace. So we thank you this morning for creating us and putting us here. May our words and our actions 